right. Happy Monday, everybody. Good morning, all you magnificent melon heads. Happy Monday. Today is August 14, 2023. We have arrived at our new 9 a.m. time slot, which we'll be doing the morning update live at this time every day from henceforth. You guys have spoken. We did a poll on the channel, and 80% of you said you would prefer this time slot over 9.30. Ask and you shall receive. And here we are at long last. It looks like the collapse of the China housing bubble is upon us. It looks like those first dominoes have started falling. Everything started with the Evergrande collapse back in 2021 and 2022. I covered it a lot on my channel, and then things got quiet for a while. We didn't hear much about the China real estate collapse for a couple of months. I mentioned it briefly several times, and I kept saying, guys, this is still out there. That debt pile is still out there. That bubble is still inflated. Just because we're not hearing about it, don't think that story has gone away. And that story came roaring back last week with the imminent or the seemingly imminent collapse of Country Garden. Now, Country Garden does not have as big of a debt pile as Evergrande, 200 billion versus 350 billion for Evergrande, but Country Garden is a much bigger firm. Four times the size of Evergrande, 650,000 apartments already sold that they have not built. And it looks like they're out of money. Country Garden first missed $2 bond payments last week. That sent the initial jitters through markets. And then I mentioned Friday in my live stream, like, hey, guys, buried 15 paragraphs down in this article was that Country Garden had hired this CICC firm, that's China International Credit Corporation, and that they had hired the firm to look at their yuan-denominated bonds. And I said, whoa, whoa, pump the brakes, everybody. That's a big deal because they missed the payment on their dollar bonds, but this credit firm is coming in to work on their yuan bonds. And I said, that's huge, guys. That means they're about to default on their yuan, their domestic onshore bonds as well. And I said, guys, this 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 firm is dead. They've got days to live. They're not even trying to save their dollar bonds. They're going after the yuan bonds next, which they, ha- which they hadn't even missed payments on. Well, this morning, oh, all 11 of Country Garden's yuan-denominated bonds I've been halted trading. Hey, why didn't I think of that? The asset can't go down in value if you don't allow it to trade. Now we're thinking outside the box, Country Garden. Nice, huh? Yeah, see, that's how that works. But it's not just Country Garden. It's spreading. It has now gone beyond the real estate market because Zhang Ji, I apologize in advance for my mispronunciation. Zhang Ji is a trust company kind of like an asset manager, they're they're referred to as shadow banks. Well, they have now missed payments on some of their wealth management products, which are these shady off balance sheet, fake bond kind of a debt products that they love to sell over in China. Zhang Ji is a massive trust company. So what it looks like may be starting to happen here. And now I'm now we're getting into a little bit of me speculating and supposing I just want to draw that line. It looks like people see Country Garden going down after Evergrande going down and saying, that's it, the jig is finally up, and they're trying to withdraw their money. And much like we could see here in the States, to a lesser extent with the commercial real estate bubble, when people start pulling their money out of firms like this, these these trust companies, well, they have to sell assets to raise the cash to meet those redemptions. And what are the assets? Buildings that nobody lives in that nobody wants to buy, or buildings that have been sold that the developer never built, and so there's no cash flow coming from them. Certainly nobody wants to buy that, which means we could start to see these trust companies experiencing what looks like a bank run, which means they would probably halt withdrawals. They'd probably stop making payments. And once the trust companies start going, it's only a matter of time before we're right back where we were last fall with people outside of banks demanding their money back. And the banks see this coming too. New loan growth, new yuan-denominated loans in China just came out Friday afternoon, down 90% in a month. That's not a year-over-year number. That's not versus pre-pandemic levels. That's compared to June, 90% contraction in the issuance of new loans. The banks aren't lending. They are on defense. They're holding what little cash they have left, and they're waiting for all the carnage around them. Guys, this is 
When, when the banks go on defense, when the lending stops, that's what we saw in 08. That's what we saw in 2020. That's what we saw in the dot-com era. When the banks stop lending, big problems happen. China has already slipped into deflation. And don't think it's going to be limited to China. A lot of American companies are in the news this morning. Dow, DuPont, Caterpillar, companies that get a lot of their earnings from China. Foxconn, reducing their forecast. That can't be good for Apple. Not going to be selling many iPhones in China. So don't for a second think that this story will stay limited to just China. And guys, if you were at the Silver Symposium last year, you would have seen this coming because my whole presentation at the Silver Symposium was about the enormity of the China housing bubble, its causes, this this unbelievable scope of it, especially relative to what many of us considered to be a housing bubble here in the States. It's not even comparable. The numbers just blow you away when you see how big the problem has gotten. You would have seen this coming if you were at that event. And with that, we are going to shrink my big melon of a head. And won't you please, while we're doing that, go ahead and smash that like button. It really helps me out for the YouTube algorithm. And if you're new to the channel, we do this every day now at 9 a.m. So won't you please subscribe and come stay for a while. CNN's Fear Greed Index at 63 this morning, down just a little bit. Again, the fear is slowly creeping back into markets, although we are still in greed territory. The S&P futures right now looking like it's going to open pretty much flat, down about five points. Dow futures down about 27 points or 0.07%. And the NASDAQ looks like set to open down about 0.1%, down about 18 points. The DXY this morning, the dollar is ripping higher. We are up 35 basis points above 103 on the DXY. Uh, big move in the dollar strengthening this morning. I just wanted to show you guys this chart. This is a uh, going back to about the beginning of the year in the DXY. And I want to point your attention right here because we are coming up on the 200-day moving average of the DXY. We'll see if that level acts as resistance. That is right around, what do we got, about 103.3 is the 200-day moving average. Watch that level for a rejection or a breakout above. Looking over at commodities, not liking the higher dollar this morning. We've got gold is down five bucks, five and a half at 1,941 for December gold futures. Silver, September futures at 2258. That's down about two cents, pretty much flat for the day. WTI crude oil, September futures at 81.99, down a dollar 20. That is undoubtedly on fears of what's happening in China. Also, it could have something to do with attacks in the Black Sea over the weekend. The Kerch Bridge leading into the Crimean Peninsula was hit again over the weekend. Looks like, as of last night at least, I haven't checked the marine traffic yet this morning, but ships were starting to stack up on both sides of the Kerch Strait. I'm not sure if that's going to have any impact on oil or grain flows out of the Black Sea, but that's also something to watch. Looking over at the bond market right now, We've got the 30-year is up about a point and a half at 4.29. The 10-year is up two basis points, yielding 4.18. Yields moving higher again this morning, although just a little bit. The two-year is up four basis points, 4.93 on the two-year, and the one-month is at 5.39, up one basis point. So let's talk about what's going on overseas in China right now. First of all, the, the story, this is the new story. It hit over the weekend. There was rumors of this Friday. It looks like we have confirmation of it this morning. China finance giants missed payments, alarm regulators, and markets. Several firms saw overdue payments on Zhongzhi-linked products. The property crisis has now spread to the $2.9 trillion trust industry. One of China's largest private wealth managers has triggered fresh anxiety about the health of the country's shadow banking industry after missing payments on multiple high-yield investment products. Shadow banking sounds a little spooky. Shadow bank is a term used for businesses where their business model resembles a bank, but they don't have the same licensing regulatory compliance limitations that banks have. Here in the States, Insurance companies and hedge funds are sometimes referred to as shadow banks also because they borrow money at a certain percentage and they loan money at a certain percentage and the difference is their profit. Therefore, they're calling them a shadow bank. The turmoil at Zhongzhi Enterprises Group, or ZEG, a secretive financial conglomerate that manages about a trillion yuan, which is about $138 billion, surged to the fore after several of its corporate clients disclosed overdue payments by a trust unit. In a sign that Chinese authorities are worried about potential contagion, the banking regulator has set up a task force to examine risks at Zhangji, 
according to people familiar with the matter. There's those anonymous sources again. Don't you just love it? While little is known outside China, Zhang Ji is among the biggest players in the country's $2.9 trillion trust industry, which combines characteristics of commercial and investment banking, private equity, and wealth management. Firms in the sector pool savings from wealthy households and corporate clients to offer loans and invest in real estate, stocks, bonds, and commodities. And the struggle, the key word right there is that real estate. All right, so these firms take money from people, promising them a return on their investment, and then they take those people's money and they go invest in real estate projects. And a lot of these firms, against the wishes of the central government, I might add, went out last year and the year before and made big bets in China's property market. Big bets that the Chinese central bank, the PBOC, would come in and rescue the market, that there would be all of this stimulus. They made big bets on a recovery in housing. They made big bets on the China reopening narrative. Those big bets blew up in their face, and now they're missing payments that they owe to their clients. This could trigger something resembling a bank run, or maybe the word would be a shadow bank run. If redemptions at these trusts start, if people start pulling their money and these trusts are forced to start selling assets, they will not be able to meet these withdrawals. So look for stories and within the next few days of these firms starting to halt redemptions or halt withdrawals. As people run for the exits, the first thing they do is slam the door shut. But it is not just the trust firms. It's not just the missed payments on those. Country Garden, getting even worse. China Country Garden to suspend trading of onshore bonds from Monday. Again, these are onshore bonds. These are not the same dollar-denominated bonds that they missed their payments on last week. And I mentioned it on Friday when I saw that, that subtle reference way down in that Bloomberg article that CICC had been bought in to look at their yuan-denominated bonds. I said, oh boy, this one's about to blow up. That means they're about to default on those bonds as well. And here it is this morning, this morning, China Country Garden, the country's top private property developer, will suspend trading of its 11 onshore bonds from Monday, according to filings with the Shenzhen Stock Exchange on Saturday. The asset can't go down in price if you don't let anybody sell. Isn't that nice? Isn't that, isn't that just great of them to do that to people? So if you're trapped in these bonds, if you bought them, not only are they probably not going to make the interest payments that they owe you, but you can't even sell that bond not even for pennies on the dollar. They just won't let it trade. Resumption of trading of the bonds will be determined at a later date. I swear, I promise I'm good for it. The company said in a filing to the stock exchange. Country Gardens Hong Kong shares hit a record low on Friday on fears the company is preparing for a debt restructuring, adding to concerns about the outlook for the property sector in the absence of stronger support from Beijing. And check this one out. This this. I saw this one last night when my moderator, Mish, sent me this story. Shout out to Mish. Thank you for everything you do for the channel, brother. And I said it was like my John Told moment from Mar the movie Margin Call. This is it. I mean, this is it. This isn't the music slowing. This is the music stopping. China July new bank loans tumble. Credit growth weakens further. The numbers here, guys. China's new bank loans tumbled in July and other key credit gauges also weakened even after policymakers cut interest rates and promised to roll out more support for the faltering economy. So they're already not quite full-blown stimmies, not helicoptering money, but they've already lowered interest rates to try to spur more borrowing and more lending, and it hasn't worked. Chinese bank extended 345.9 billion yuan, which is only about $47.8 billion, of new yuan loans in July. That's tumbling 89% from June to the lowest since late 2009, a.k.a. the GFC, and falling far short of analyst forecasts, data from the People's Bank of China showed on Friday. An 89% decline in loans, guys, and that's the month-over-month -month number. That's just the change from June to July. There's not a year-over-year. -year. That's not a pre-pandemic thing. One month, loans down almost 90%. The country's economy is frozen. The lending is frozen, which means debt-strapped companies like Country Garden that need money, can't get it. Nobody will loan it to them, which means these defaults are going to start piling up. If there's no loan growth, if there's no credit out there, then these companies that are basically Ponzi schemes, you have to understand real estate development in China, they are legalized Ponzi schemes. They sell the apartment for pre-sale money, and then they use the pre-sale funds to go ahead and pay for the construction of the apartments that they sold last year. And if that doesn't make up the difference, then they borrow money from the banks 
to be able to finish those projects. And then they go and they're like, okay, we're going to do this other project. We need to pre-sell those apartments, 650,000 of them that they've already sold. But now there's no new money coming in. Nobody wants to pre-order an apartment from a country or from country garden that can't pay its bonds. And so there's no new money coming in from apartment pre-sales. And so they can't finish the apartments that they already owe. And now they can't go to the banks to borrow the money to finish the apartments because the banks won't lend down 90% in a month. These firms are done. They're toast. And it's going to spread to other sectors of the economy. Something this big doesn't, you, you can't have something this big go down without knock on effects. And people in China are already running for the hills. Another story that Mish caught. Check this one out. Shanghai woman in focus as probe shows fear of capital flight. Wealthy Chinese are trying to get their money out of the country. Chinese state-run media outlets are adding credence to speculation that an executive who helps wealthy families move their money to the U.S. was among those detained last week for illegal currency trading as President Xi Jinping's government moves to prevent capital outflows in the face of economic woes. Again, the tyrants, every time there's trouble, they slam the exits and they lock people inside, just like we're seeing, uh, who is it, um, who's the big B-REIT? The Blackstone Real Estate Investment Trust, right? When things in commercial real estate here in the States got bad, they halted redemptions. They slammed the doors shut so people can't get out. They're doing the same thing in China. Shanghai police announced Thursday that they had detained five people for illegal foreign currency transactions worth some 100 million yuan, about $13.8 million, including a woman surnamed He, these jokes write themselves, age 54, who ran an immigration service company. Officials didn't give He's full name or identify the firm. Since then, at least two state media outlets have published stories citing online rumors that the person detained was He May. Or he may not. We don't know. I don't want to rush to judgment. A Shanghai immigration executive. One outlet owned by the Shanghai government said the police statement had been released in response to speculation over he. Who is he may, who is also she. Uh, uh. Linda he, as she is, <laughs> Linda he, as she is known in English, is the chair and president of the Weilian Overseas Consulting Group, a Shanghai-based firm that helps rich Chinese citizens acquire visas to Western nations, secure spots for their children in elite foreign schools, and facilitates overseas investments, according to its website. An employee at Weilian's Shanghai office on Friday said they weren't aware of reports of his detention, adding that the founder wasn't around in recent days without elaborating. Employees inside the office appeared to be working as normal. Shanghai police didn't respond to a request for comment on he's full identity. He who is a her. So this woman who helps people get out of the country with their money and get their kids into schools disappeared last week. Nobody knows where she is because China's cracking down on capital flight. Slam the doors shut. And, well, it's going to come to the U.S., guys. This is going to affect us here in the States. The world is too intertwined, even after the much publicized U.S.-China breakup and the trade war. This is going to spread to us. China's worsening economy is hurting corporate America. Caterpillar and DuPont are among big companies lowering expectations for a post-COVID-19 boom. The slowdown is registering in earnings results across a range of companies, from chemical giants DuPont and Dow to heavy equipment suppliers such as Caterpillar. Some companies expressed disappointment with Beijing's stimulus measures and cut their sales outlook for the country into this year. China orders, listen to these numbers, China orders were down 20% in the first quarter, 40% in the second quarter, but really 50% in June, said Rain, Rainer Blair, chief executive officer at Washington, D.C.-based Donaher, describing a downturn in sales of the company's bioprocessing equipment. Frankly, we don't see that getting better in the second half. 20% down in the first quarter, 40% in the second quarter, within that 40% second quarter, down 50% in June. So the decline is accelerating. It's getting worse. It's not getting better. So they're talking about Dow. They're talking about DuPont. They're talking about Caterpillar. They're talking about Danaher. Check this one out. This morning, this is in Zero Hedge. iPhone maker Foxconn slashes full-year sales outlook on sliding smartphone demand. Taiwan's Foxconn, the world's largest contract electronics maker, downgraded its full-year outlook on Monday morning. Here's a quote. However, considering many external variables in response to uncertainties such as global monetary tightening, geopolitical tensions, and inflation, 
the full year outlook is now expected to slightly decline from previous flattish expectations. The downgrade comes as consumers and corporations reduce spending on increasing macroeconomic headwinds as China's recovery stalls. Companies ranging from Apple to Qualcomm to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing have all indicated that the industry downturn, which began post-pandemic, might persist longer than previously anticipated. So you can add all those names to the list that we just talked about, Dow, DuPont, Caterpillar, Danaher. Now we've got Foxconn, Taiwan Semi. Uh, who else do we have here? Apple, Qualcomm. Remember when we were talking about Taiwan Semiconductor and about Samsung, about how some of these numbers, they were down 90% year over year, the semiconductor companies, just these massive earnings declines, and how CNBC and the mainstream financial press was just so quick to say, that's it, the worst is over. With no supporting data whatsoever, they just threw into these articles, the worst is behind us, yay us. This is saying otherwise. This is saying Foxconn just reduced their guidance and you know, downgrading. This is from the CEO of Foxconn. So where did the mainstream financial press get this idea that the worst in semiconductors was behind us when they told us all clear, bottoms in, stocks go up, soft landing, no recession, recession canceled, good news. There was nothing in the data supporting it. It was all just hype. Last thing, guys, I want to mention here, check this one out. The yen breaches the 145 mark against the dollar, prompting expectations of a BOJ intervention. Be on the lookout later this week. There may be a story coming that the Bank of Japan is selling dollars to prop up the failing yen. Again, when you see this go above 145, that is the yen weakening against the dollar. And I just want to show you guys the chart of the Japanese yen to the U.S. dollar. Here we are just over 145. We're actually at 145.4 right now. All right, we've taken out our recent highs. And I just want to show you right here where this red arrow is. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. See this red arrow that I drew? That was September 22nd. That was the last time the BOJ announced an intervention in the yen's value. And we are now higher than that level where the Japanese intervened last time at 145. So we still went higher after the Japanese intervened in September. We went as high as almost 150. We may have breached 150 for a few hours there. But we're now at that level where the BOJ could get involved. BOJ selling U.S. Treasuries could put upward pressure on U.S. yields. Stocks would probably not like that. Just wanted to mention that one. And check this guy out. If you have not already seen Rich Men from Richmond, the song by this guy, I can't remember his name. Oh, it was Anthony something. Shoot, I forgot his name. But check out Rich Men North of Richmond. Good God. Every now and then, guys, there is a song. And look, I'm not a country guy. I don't really at all like country music. That's just not my thing. No offense to you country guys. But wow, this song was powerful. The lyrics, the words in this song. Go check this thing out. This went viral over the weekend. This guy is just rebuilding his life. A week ago, he was playing at a bar for 20 people. Last night, he played at the same bar for thousands of people. This song has gotten millions of views. It has become the anthem of the downtrodden working man in the United States. Check that out if you haven't already seen it. If you've been watching this channel, I guarantee you this song will hit home for you. And, uh, well, just go watch it and be sure to tell them nobody sent you. And last but not least, guys, the Silver Symposium, September 29th, October 1st, in beautiful Las Vegas at Caesars Palace. I will be there. I will be giving a talk there. Joe Brown from Heresy Financial, The Economic Ninja, Dan from I Allegedly, Chris Taylor from Financial Prepper, Andy Sheckman, David Bork, and all the biggest names in the precious metal space. And if you were at this event last year, you would have seen this China story coming because I gave a whole big detailed talk. I actually did it twice about the China housing bubble. After I gave the talk about the China housing bubble, I had about a dozen people came up to me and said, I heard the talk on the China housing bubble was awesome and I missed it. Could, we, could you talk to us about it? So I got out my laptop and I just did an impromptu encore off in the corner about the China housing presentation. Amazing, amazing the numbers involved in the China housing bubble. And if you were at Stockpole Silver Symposium last year, this would be old news for you. You would have seen this coming. So check this one out at September 29th and October 1st. This is a great event. There is a link down below in the description, an affiliate link. If you use that, you'll get 10% off your tickets. And I'll put a link in the comments as well. All right, guys, that is about all I got for you today. Thank you so much, everybody, for your time this morning. Thank you for joining us on our earlier time slot. And thank you to my Patreon supporters for everything you guys do for the channel. Link down below should you feel so inclined. 
Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. Till next time, live small and dream big.